Ladies and gentlemen, I am Alang Skanda, your moderator for the session on Tropical Agriculture in Malaysia, State of Play, that will be presented by Dr. Surina Ismail. Dr. Surina Ismail holds a Bachelor in Science, Honours in Chemistry from uh, Indiana University, Master of Science in Organic Polymer from University of Massachusetts, and PhD in Bio-Organic Polymer from University Akron, USA, with experiences in the academia working as a research fellow, visiting scientist, and assistant professor in the USA. Dr. Surina Ismail currently holds the position of Group Head of Sustainability, IOI Corporation Berhad. In this capacity, she is responsible for corporate sustainability, which includes in embedding the sustainability culture within the groups, as well as aligning the group business strategy and sustainability policies together with the implementation for the whole IOI Group Plantation and Manufacturing Divisions. Without further ado, allow me to pass the session to Dr. Surina. Doctor, you may now begin your presentation. Good morning. Presentation right now. Uh, is it on the screen? So um, I would like to start with first uh, thanking my uh, the organizer for inviting me to present this presentation. Um, before I begin, I would like to also uh, introduce myself as the Group Head of Sustainable for IOI Corporation. And I think it's really important for me to, rep to also introduce the organization that I am representing. So in the first instance, um, IOI Corporation is one of the largest vertically integrated palm oil company in Malaysia. We have operations in, um, uh, of course, Southeast Asia as our HQ, but more than that, we have also operation in Europe, uh, in, in North America, as well as uh, presence in South America, Africa, and um, uh, uh, the whole of Asia. So in looking at our operation, we, as I say, is an oil palm plantation. Um, we have about 170,000 uh, hectare of land that we have planted with oil, oil palm. And we have about 96 uh, estates. Uh, and we practice what we call circular economy within our estates. And downstream, we have production in oleochemical and speci specialty pets. Uh, as a snapshot of our sustainability activities in 2019, uh, we are a, a member of the Roundtable Sustainable Palm Oil, as well as fully certified in all our estates in the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Certification. Uh, we have about 15,000 hectares of land that we've put aside for conservation. We practice fire management, which is very, very important uh, in, in the light of uh, the, the instances of fires and, and droughts uh, in, other, in our country. And we also uh, look into practicing landscape level approach, uh, both in Indonesia and Malaysia where we are present. So in a matter of sustainability, we, we support the global initiative for greener earth. We have our pillars of sustainability as specifically people, planet, prosperity, plus together with partnership in alignment with um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have actually chosen six, which is most relevant to our operation. Uh, the one being uh, UN SDG 2, UN SDG 8, uh, which is uh, decent and work and economic growth, um, as well as UN SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life on land, and partnership for the goals. Well, you know, after looking through what we are we uh, represent, let us go into the, the main topic of this presentation, which is tropical agriculture in Malaysia. Looking at tropical agriculture development, we have to look into the drivers and requirements for agricultural development. You look into as the, the the, the key for creation of rural employment and reduction of poverty. 
Uh, one of the aspects that we have to look at is the aspects of economics. How can we uplift the rural employment uh, in order for us to to help the poverty, uh, to help reduce poverty in the rural areas? Uh, there are several drivers, um, and uh, I will not go through all of them. But some of them, of course, is about land development. How can we ensure that land development is uh, conducted in a manner that will be will maximize the you know, um, the usage of that land. How do we ensure that as a driver, we can have environmental benefits aside from just land development? Make sure that social acceptance within the community of doing the work of rural employment is something not to be uh, looked down upon. Because uh, as you know, a lot of the rural employment, a, a lot of activity in the rural areas have been sidelined by activities in uh, of you know of migration in the urban areas. We look into legislations to help ensure that the uh, creation of rural employment is done in a methodical, precise way. Um, and and last but not least, you need to look into technology platform to ensure that we are maximizing or optimizing the operation in the rural employment. Let's look at the tropical agriculture in Malaysia. Uh, in terms of our tropical agriculture in Malaysia, we find that the contribution of agriculture to the e economic activity in Malaysia is 7.3%. Now, looking backwards in 1970, we looked at uh, the contribution of agriculture to the GDP is about 28.8%. It has now reduced down to 7.3%, 7.3%, simply because of the fact that activities like service, the service sector and the manufacturing sector has overtaken our, uh, uh, the contribution, contribution to, to our GN, uh, GDP. Um, however, you have to understand as well that although our contribution to the GDP has reduced to 7.3%, our output is still relatively high. Um, the, the states that mainly contributes to the agricultural GDP is Sabah, Sarawak, and Johor, uh, while states like the Wilayah uh, Kuala Lumpur, Selangor, and Penang are mostly uh, involved in activities like manufacturing and the service sector. Specifically, the contributor of uh, the major contributor to agricultural GDP is actually oil palm at 37.9%, followed by other agriculture, livestock, uh, fishing, forestry, and rubber. Uh, on, a, on my slide, I, I have clearly put down the percentage. And you can see that uh, in terms of uh, the exports and imports, both activities has actually reduced from, in, from 2017 to 2018. This doesn't mean that we you know we have actually reduced our output. Specifically, what happens is that the, the reduction of exports from a 9.5% in 2017 to 2018 is because of the fact that we are utilizing you are utilizing more of our domestic activity for domestic use. And that is also reflected in the fact that we actually reduce our imports from 2017 to 2018. And I think that's a very good thing because it ensure it's it points out to the trend that we are becoming a little bit more self-reliant on uh, food supply or agricultural supply in Malaysia. Uh, looking at the employed persons in the agricultural sector in 2018, we recorded about 1.6 million uh, being employed in the sector. Uh, it is very, very skewed towards the male gender, about 77.7%. And non-citizens contribute about a third of those employed in this agricultural sector, about um, 492,000. Uh, so let's look at what is the most prominent GDP contributor in agriculture, palm oil. Is palm oil still going to be relevant for the world's need? Is it still going to be relevant as a contributor in agriculture in Malaysia? So let's look at the world scenario. The increasing population from 7.7 billion in 2020 to 9 billion in 2050 
means that the world will need an additional 150 million tons of oil and fats to feed the world. So there is a land requirement for this crop to achieve. We look at what is the contribution of oil palm. In terms of the land required to uh, produce 150, additional 150 million tons of oils, 38 million. Now we compare that with rapeseed, 187 million. So that is about six times more land than oil palm. And then sunflower, about 250 million. That's about eight times, um, uh, not eight times, but seven times, almost seven, seven times more. And you look at soybean, which is about 375 million hectare. And that comes to about almost eight times. So what is the implication? The more land that you use, the more you will create deforestation. So it is almost a no brainer to say that oil palm would be the most uh, effective uh, use of land. So advantage of palm oil over oil palm over other vegetable oil crops are, as I've said earlier, high yield per hectare. And uh, not only the fact that we have byproduct advantages, the biomass that we have, we have, for example, used it in circular economy. So for example, in our estates, we have used that as a, as a means for fertilizer. We have used the biomass as well for uh, energy to run our mills. We have byproducts like the palm fatty acid distillates that, that can be used in uh, downstream products. Uh, the chemical composition that can be used in food and non-food production, and this is very, very unique to oil palm. The palm oil can be used specifically for food, while the palm kernel oil is specifically used for uh, uh, oleochemicals. So for example, the products of detergent, your soap, um, uh, cosmetics, uh, not to mention the health aspects of oil palm, which has no trans fatty acids, which is rich in vitamin A and E, uh, carotenoid. Uh, these are all aspects that are advantages that you can see in oil palm over other vegetable oils. However, uh, it's, there's no denying that oil palm has been criticized over practices deemed unsustainable, uh, both to nature and communities. So in order for the future acceptance by the global community, it means that oil palm must be grown sustainably. So in Malaysia, for example, the introduction of the Malaysian sustainable palm oil is a, is a perfect example of how to lift the whole sector in Malaysia to practice sustainability. Now let's look at the state of play in Malaysia. Now, I think that there is no denying that you have to balance the social, environmental, and economic aspects. But to balance that, that's the challenge. The people, the planet, and the prosperity. How do we do this? Now, in order for us to do this, we must first address the areas of contention. So looking at the people aspects, the social aspects of agricultural production. We need to ensure that the rights of the local communities are taken care of. We need to ensure that they have been consulted, they have been informed, they have been, uh, they are involved in all the activities regarding what is specifically the, their area of livelihood. We need to ensure that labor rights are being taken care of. In other words, are we ensuring that the, 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 the people involved in the rural in, in agriculture production, are they being paid right? Are they not being uh, taken advantage of? We need to ensure that there's no forced labor. Children or women's or, or women's right needs to be taken care of. Uh, we in Malaysia employ a lot of foreign workers. Therefore, the foreign the rights of the foreign workers also needs to be taken care of because they are part and parcel of how our agriculture production has succeeded. Therefore, freedom of association for them is also something that we need to ensure. When you look at agriculture production, the area of contention, without doubt, is about the environmental aspects. There is so many uh, um, uh, talks about deforestation, about the fact that the biodiversity and wildlife are not protected. So we need to ensure that um, the rehabilitation of our peeps 
of our riparian areas need to be done uh, and need to be uh, monitored, need to be um, taken care of in order for us to ensure that the area where we operate is going to be an area that has balance between what we want to achieve in terms of our uh, land usage as opposed to the area in which it needs to be protected. So water management, waste management, pollution control, these are all aspects of agriculture production that cannot be sidelined. If we look into what is, uh, what is our effect around the land, we are not there for just like one year or two years. We are going to go there, we are going to be uh, working the land for years to come. Therefore, we need to take care of this area. Greenhouse gas emission and carbon footprint. This has been mentioned earlier by Professor Joy in her very uh, interesting um, presentation. So we as uh, uh, the workers of this land need to ensure that the greenhouse gas emission and, the, and our carbon footprint within the space that we work at would be taken care of as well. In terms of the economic aspects, there's no doubt that you know it has to be a win-win situation. You cannot expect someone to work or work on agriculture production without having the advantage of economic aspects. Now, the arguments that the developing world requires the land to be developed in order to uplift our uh, rural uh, population means that the productivity and yield of the land that we work must be optimized and increased. That will be the only way that we can live, we can uplift the living standards of the community. That is also the way in which we can uh, offset rising costs of production and declining prices. And declining prices can absolutely be because of competition. Uh, it could be also because of um, uh, the, the importance of that product. So the uptake of agriculture products need to be also looked at in order for us to ensure that we get the best um, uh, you know, return for the work that we do on the land. Now, increased air regulations and requirement is a difficulty for the rural, uh, rural um, population, simply because increased regulations means a constriction in how we do work. But it has to be addressed because of the fact that increased regulations and requirement help us to be more methodical, help us to ensure that there is no breach of the area in which we work. So having looked at the areas of contention, let's look at how we need, how we uh, can uh, achieve um, strengthening this area of air culture product production for the next decade. Now adoption of technologies are very, very important because adoption of technologies ensures that we can optimize our usage, not just on um, uh, you know, same old, same old method, but also to make sure that we have uh, an, uh, 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 an efficient way of approaching our uh, agriculture production. Um, technologies like Industry 4.0, for example, these are big data analytics that helps to transform our operation. Uh, in the uh, palm oil uh, industry, for oil palm industry, for example, we can use field operations um, with unmanned aerial spray and pruning. Now, how does this help? This helps us by reducing our dependence on labor. Um, but it also increases our capability to be very efficient. Promoting sustainable agriculture and prioritization of land use. Addressing proper, chem proper chemical fertilizer use, for example, means that we are promoting um, sustainable agriculture because then uh, we are using the best agriculture, ag best chemicals of fertilizer to ensure that we get the best yield and the best uh, product from our land. And this also increase our land use um, uh, and also uh, the contribution of our land use and the innovation that we use by uh, having high yielding seedling as well as well, so as will mean that we have high yields and best management practice um, using of mechanization and a practice of circular economy, all of this contributes to promoting sustainable agriculture. 
we need to have a greater understanding of the market needs. Uh, say, for example, the market requires a certain agriculture product. All right, for us to create that 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 product from uh, looking at how we can focus on on downstream products to create value, this is how we should go forward. We shouldn't be just planting any. Uh, you know, any products without understanding what is the requirement of the market. We need policies and strategies by the government, and this must be aligned with the private sectors. Because um, having one policies and strategies that are in, uh, you know, in a vacuum um, and, and not required by the market means that we are not helping our agriculture production to meet the needs of the market. Uh, finally, without doubt, decent work in the rural economy, and the only and one of the best way we can do is to have greater modernization to attract the new generation. There's no doubt that the in Malaysia, the rural population the, uh, is is aging because most of the young are migrating to the urban areas. So, in order for us to encourage uh, them to stay back in the rural area is to, for example, provide um, new technology to, to provide knowledge gaps by investing in educations and skills for the rural youth. Uh, from the player's perspective, we need to also look at the challenges. If you look at the challenges, labor obligations and shortages, scarcity of resources, aging rural population, these are the challenges that you find in the rural area. We also look at the parts of the smallholders. You know, if you look at the smallholders, they have a limited, uh, um, um, you know, advantages in terms of um, understanding new technology. They have a limited advantage in um, being exposed to the, the best management practice. Um, they, have, they, don't can't, they don't have the kind of resources that can help uh, the, the, you know, the agriculture industry to move forward. So these are some of the challenges that you are, you are facing. Now, without doubt, competition from other markets are also a very important aspect of what the players in the agriculture industries are facing. So in Malaysia, for example, there is um, you know, competition from uh, countries like Indonesia, which have a larger land bank, and thereby producing products which are cheaper, for example, because of the fact that they have a lot more land. Uh, we need to be a lot more careful and more niche in our approach in producing products. Uh, last but not least, of course, the climate change uh, is one of the aspects that we face in, ag in the agriculture industry. This has been uh, spoken at length about how extreme weathers affect agriculture production, and not to mention the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic, now how does it do it? Uh, in an area where uh, labor is uh, a, a shortage in Malaysia, COVID-19 means that we are going to have issues in having uh, uh, foreign workers coming in to help us to run our uh, some parts of our agriculture. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, non-citizens make up about almost a third of our uh, labor in the rural, uh, um, in the agriculture industry. Um, in addition to all this, we have to understand that sustainability makes economic sense. Uh, again, climate change results in growing physical climate risk. Uh, it in, it, it it, it means that there's increasing regulatory risk and the government's roles in it to ensure that climate change can be mitigated. Uh, there is a demographic demand, uh, demographic and demand shift in our food trends. So for example, um, uh, people are moving away from eating a lot of meat to more vegetarian. So uh, we look into for example, the campaign against climate-related violations. Now, Malaysia faces a lot of it during the haze of uh, last year, uh, where we have been accused of burning uh, some parts of our, uh, uh, you know, contributing to haze. These are all matters that we need to address. 
So sustainability makes economic sense because if you address this matter, we can actually uh, produce a product that is acceptable, acceptable globally uh, and also protect our country against uh, issues of climate change. Uh, we need to also, for example, address the need uh, of the investors uh, on our risk man management. And this is also being mentioned by the previous uh, speaker. The need to address carbon sequestration and footprint of perennial crops versus uh, annual crops. These are all matters that we need to look at when we talk about climate change. Now, I always believe that out of uh, challenges comes opportunities. Um, you know, when you look at the fact that we are, have a shortage of land, uh, the best way that we can look at is how do we increase productivity to address uh, um, deforestation, wildlife protection and land shortages, uh, market transformation and shared responsibilities by all players towards global responsibilities of climate change. We need to make sure that we have transparency and sharing of sustainable practices and successes. Uh, human rights, uh, labor issues, labor exploitation, this all needs to be addressed. Government supported tools and approaches to support rural development, like the mandated certification scheme, like MSPO, to uplift the whole sector via best practices and towards achieving sustainability and traceability. These are all the, the opportunities that we can now uh, undertake. And the attention to biodiversity and community needs during the agriculture development needs to be addressed to ensure a balanced approach of conservation and development. Now, finally, I'm looking at the key points to consider uh, in ensuring sustainable agricultural development, traceability and sustainability, environmental aspects, societal aspects, and economy aspects. These are all topics that I have mentioned earlier. Just looking at how sustainability includes the traceability activities and how it addresses the environment social and economic aspects are something that we need to absolutely adopt and, 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 uh, and make sure that we continue uh, working on it. No deforestation, water management, promoting labor rights, uh, filling in the necessary knowledge gaps for best practices, uh, and time and resources, a uh, resource intensive requirement that the government needs to uh, contribute so that we can meet the global needs. So in, in, uh, in an essence, there's no real alternative but sustainably grown agricultural products. We require global awareness about what is happening to the world and government regulations and incentives to ensure that our country goes towards the future, understanding that this is not uh, you know, sustainably grown agriculture products is not, it's not just an option, but it is a, uh, it's a necessity. Uh, it should be aided by civil society, which forms our conscience, and the commitments are, and participation of all players along the supply chains, from the growers and farmers to consumer goods manufacturers and, and, the, uh, and the consumers itself. So I, I truly believe that all parties must share the cause and the responsibility of sustainability. So with that, I, I thank you. And I hope that uh, I have managed to um, impart some understanding of why sustainably produced agricultural products is the way to go in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Serena, for a very enlightening presentation on uh, the state of play that should be taken for uh, tropical agriculture in this pandemic, uh, pandemic times. So, Doctor, uh, I'm a bit curious, um, in terms of sustainability, because it, uh, IOI has put sustainability as one of the main uh, aspects on uh, your practices. So, uh, do you practice some uh, uh, sustainable practices like uh, integration farming, for instance? Like the common ones would be uh, cattle with uh, oil palm plantation or any other approach that I, I has uh, in um, leading the sustainability process, uh, practices. Yeah, um, in our palm, uh, in our oil palm plantation, uh, we do practice uh, um, what we call uh, not so much as integrated uh, farming as the way you are looking at, but what we do is um, 
uh, we have, for example, landscape level approach. Now, what we do is that within the plantation itself, um, uh, we, of course, uh, work together with the community uh, to ensure that the community has contribution to our land development. Uh, so not only in terms of rural uh, um, uh, employment, but we also make sure that they are involved in, for example, fire monitoring. Uh, we are also working with them to ensure that they have, um, so in Indonesia, for example, we, we, we work with them to, uh, in such projects like beekeeping. Uh, we work with them with uh, planting of cashews. Uh, uh, we also work with them to build up nurseries to, um, you know, to ensure that if there's any areas that needs to be rehabilitated, they can, uh, uh, get the um, uh, seedlings of you know um, that can be re replanted or rehabilitating the, the, the areas like the our peat areas or for example uh, areas where there there are that needs uh, re um, uh, rehabilitation. <clears throat> okay, so we have uh, several questions from the viewers. Okay, so the first one would be uh, small scale farmers throughout the tropics have faced serious challenges due to climate variability, lack of appropriate agricultural uh, infrastructure, shortage of farming skills, and though uh, economic uh, and tough economic uh, conditions. What kind of support do they need from our government? So I can, you know, I'm from the oil palm industry. So I think yeah. I can probably give you the best example on what is yeah. happening. So, as you know, the Malaysian government has introduced the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil uh, uh, Certification. <clears throat> and what it does is that it, uh, it forces not just the big players to adopt sustainable practice, but also the small, medium, and the small holders. Now, without doubt, the small holders are one of the most difficult uh, part in which to, to pull into this whole process. Now, 40% of the 40% um, of uh, small smallholders contribute 40% to the oil palm industry. So, what the Malaysian government has done is that they have had clusters of these smallholders and essentially uh, brought them together because of the fact that in Malaysia, for you to uh, be able to sell your fresh fresh food bunches. Require, they require what we call the Malaysian Palm Oil Board licenses. So this, through this, we are able to trace all our smallholders that is going to participate in selling the fresh fruit bunches to the mills. Um, so what it does is that then uh, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board would go ahead and uh, uh, you know, um, illustrate or, 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 or uh, help the smallholders to understand best management practices. Now, in our space, we have smallholders. We have also worked together with Malaysian Palm Oil Board to educate our smallholders on the best management practices. And this includes how to use the optimized amount of um, fertilizers, how to ensure that you, know, you use the proper seedlings, how to ensure um, that, you know, to take care of the soil. So these are the sort of things that the, the, the private sector in alignment with the government, works well to, to um, uh, encourage the whole sector to adopt sustainable practices. So I think this is a very good example of how a government, but once the government works together with the private sector, understand the, 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 the problems that the private sector sees so that we can make sure that the whole industry uh, is lifted up in terms of uh, rural um, application of agriculture um, uh, production. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the, que the second question is from um, the viewer. How, how long does it take for agriculture sector in Malaysia to be ready or in order to fully tap on into the frontier technologies applications such as artificial intelligence, internet of things and others? Yes. Okay, well, there's a lot of uh, work that's already been done. And uh, uh, again, uh, pulling on my um, 
you know, background from uh, the oil palm sector. You know, the use of drones, for example, has been, uh, you know, we have been using this for the past three years, for example, to monitor our plantations, um, to ensure, for example, is there an area that has been breached? Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of other application, there is, it, it's just a matter of whether or not the rural uh, population are exposed to this kind of technology. It's not so much as whether or not uh, it can be applied. It's a matter of whether they are exposed. And this means that uh, the rural uh, area needs to be um, more, ex uh, you know, train and understand what kind of technology is out there. So it's important, for example, the government together with the private sectors who are involved in rural um, uh, production or agriculture production to go out into the rural area to introduce this technology. And, and, and to ensure that the technology is not expensive because cost is extremely, extremely difficult for the rural, rural population to absorb, you know. So this is where, for example, the government's role, uh, perhaps in providing funds for this kind of activity can be a win-win situation because what happens is that um, if you have a private sector wanting the agricultural product, but you want to make sure that the agriculture product is produced efficiently with high yield. If the government works together with the private sector to encourage the rural uh, um, population to, uh, to, to adopt this technology, IoT, um, uh, the use of um, uh, you know, uh, technology that can uh, help to disperse the, the seedlings efficiently, all this, if this is being adopted, then, you know, everybody wins. Uh, it also, to a certain extent, cuts down on the middle men because I think one of the problems that you see in the, uh, urban, uh, in the rural area is because of the fact that at the rural area, there's a middle man that takes the profit, mm -hmm. a lot of the profit before it gets into the hands of the manufacturer. So we need to be able to, to, to get all sectors to work together. So this is where, you know, collaboration and stakeholder engagement needs to be done, but it has to be done wisely. It cannot be done in a, in a state of mind which, okay, well, you know, let's do this and it takes forever to get implemented. And this is something that we find difficult yeah, uh, yeah. You know, from the private sector when dealing with the government uh, agency. There's a lot of uh, bureaucracy that needs to go through and, and sometimes this can prevent our competitiveness going into the market. And, and that is, is definitely an issue. Yeah, yeah. So, so, there so there are challenges, are challenges by IOI is actually ready, really ready for IIR 4.0. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the, the quick question, question is in response to the rapid and high impact, impact development, development, what are the, what are the aspects, aspects we, should, we should look into, look into in ensuring, ensuring the sustainability, the sustainability in agriculture? agriculture. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I didn't get the... I mean, what, what are the aspects, aspects that we should, should look into in ensuring, ensuring the sustainability, the sustainability in, agriculture. in agriculture? Maybe some, Maybe some of, of it you have covered, covered but uh, uh, you have more, more information. information right? Okay, so, you know, adopting sustainability is more about a mindset. You know, um, it's about making sure that the culture of sustainability first is being adopted by an organization. Mm. or by the, the community. You have to have them understand that sustainability is not a lose-lose or win-lose. It's a win-win situation. It's about longevity. So once you have embedded that kind of culture in it, it makes it easier for you to adopt the kind of practices that can uh, contribute to sustainability. But to make everything clear, sustainability is expensive. Sustainability means, uh, you know, uh, putting your profit a little bit later because you need to put in first uh, operations that seem to be counterintuitive uh, to profit making. So, for example, when you are in an area where, uh, you know, that, you know, you're in the, in the agricultural land and you want to uh, produce your products, 
you know, you want to plant, you want to plant everywhere. You know, you have one hectare, you want to plant one hectare of, uh, of, your, of your products, of your, of your plants, your agriculture, um, let it be, um, you know, uh, pepper or um, any kind of products, vegetables. But you have to understand, there are areas in which you need to probably put aside to ensure that the land is not being uh, uh, compromised in the future. So for example, you have one hectare of land, it's right beside the river. Now you think you're gonna plant right to, the, to, to where the river is, but that shouldn't be the case. You need to take care of the river banks because erosion happens and it can go into your land. So with that kind of approach, you need to ensure that there is you take care of your land to make sure that the, the erosion doesn't come into your land. And that is a long term thing. That means instead of one hectare, you probably have to you can only develop, you know, um, 0.9 hectare. So that means you are losing that 0.9 hectare, 0.1 hectare. And you think, well, this is going to cost you. But come, you know, looking at it long term, if you do take care of it, you know, that means that this is where you will get the best land. Then making sure you have best management practice, using the right amount of fertilizers, using the right amount of um, uh, uh, pest management. How do you ensure these are all sustainable practice? Now, a lot of them has already been practiced, but it has never been formalized or put into a very precise met methodology that you can share with the smallholders, for example. Okay. okay. So, so uh, 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 this question this is question very, is very general. general. Uh, uh, what are the major challenges faced by agriculture sector due to the impact? Oh, mm. actually, this is. Uh, I think the for the agriculture, uh, for us, for example, mm. is the fact that um, we have to be careful to make sure that our uh, workers are fully protected. So, if we look at this, uh, if you get one of your workers sick in the estate it means that we close down the estate mm. yeah, uh, yeah. so we have to make sure that they have the proper ppe to protect themselves they have to make sure that uh, their families are protected because if your families get infected now in, in 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 the oil palm sector the families sometimes live within the estates now if the family gets infected it will infect the the the, the workers and therefore infect the whole of yeah, uh, yeah. estate so the, the workers' health is our priority in the, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, furthermore, uh, because of the pandemic as well, the government has uh, stated that they are going to stop uh, foreign workers from coming in until the end of this year. So this, is, this is also means that we have to ensure that uh, our, our workers are not compromised. So. The, the, the basic points of challenge that you find during the, uh, the, the, the pandemic is the state of health of our workers. We need to make sure that the proper guidelines are being put in place. Uh, that means, for example, making sure every day uh, that we check to see that they are healthy, that if there's any case of suspected uh, COVID-19, they have to be quarantined. In fact, when we had new workers, we had them quarantined for 14 days to ensure that they are healthy before they can even uh, come and work into our, um, uh, you know, into our estates. So these are some of the things that you have to do. So definitely the challenges in the, in the COVID-19 is uh, making sure that all the guidelines are in place, uh, our health service are, are available to attend to any uh, emergency or any related, uh, 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 you know, diseases um, to COVID-19 and also to ensure that their family are also taken care of. Yeah, yeah. So this, so this uh, uh, the next the question, question will be on, on uh, stigma, stigma on plum, plum, plum oil. oil. So uh, how, how sustainable, sustainable is palm oil? oil? It has been subjected, subjected to various, to various controversy, controversy that made international organizations called for banning palm oil due to its effect to nature. Will the idea of changing uh, palm plantation to bamboo solve palm oil effect to nature problems? Yes, this is something that, uh, you know, 
a lot of NGOs uh, have been touting. And uh, now, you know, it's uh, it's interesting that there's a lot of other NGOs that have been saying otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've always stated that, in fact, in my presentation, I've stated very, very clearly that the banning of palm oil is counterproductive. Uh, as I've stated earlier in my presentation, you know, the world is going to increase in their population. How are you going to address, um, um, you know, feeding this world? Bamboo? No, bamboo cannot feed the world. Uh, soybean requires eight times land to feed the world. Um, Rapeseed, they are not productive enough. So my answer to that is that palm oil or oil palm is grown sustainably. And growing sustainably means that we take care of our environment. We looked into conservation. We looked into biodiversity. We looked into uh, the community needs. Now, you know, whenever that we uh, go into a land, there is a process that we call free prior informed consent, where we consult the community and ask them, do you want us to be present? If you want us, how do you want to work with this? We put aside areas where it is high conservation values. We work together with a lot of civil societies, for example, to address the issue of, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, orangutan, which is the, you know, the favorite icon of uh, destruction yeah, yeah. of land. Um, we work, for example, with uh, an NGO called Hutan, uh, who is very famous in looking at how uh, you know, orangutan actually lives in, in synergy during the plantation. Uh, so all these matters of approaching uh, the, the, the agricultural production of oil palm sustainably is the answer to it, not banning palm oil, because there's no alternative. So the only alternative is to ensure that we do plant palm oil, oil palm, in a sustainable manner. Okay. I mean, I, yeah. I, I challenge you to take any kind of oil that can be as productive and not cause deforestation. And uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of NGOs that are working to ensure, not about campaigning, but ensuring that it is about the better world or the future, better future world, uh, they work together to, uh, to go towards sustainable palm oil. Okay. okay, I agree because the yield of palm oil is quite high and the byproducts can be processed with it into other things. Okay, so the next question, how do I differentiate a sustainability strategy with other plantation companies like Samdabi? You're creating competition with two <laughs> right? Now, okay, so, you know, all, I think all the growers who are part of RSPO and a part of the Malaysian Society of Palm Oil I think you know we are all working together. When it comes to sustainability, it's not a competition. We believe that uh, um, you know because we are all uh, players in the same field. We believe that if we all work towards sustainability, it is for the better good of the sector. So it's it's not about competition. Um, but of course, you know, IOI has a different way of doing things compared to Sandabi uh, or compared to uh, other. Um, um, palm oil, um, uh, um, you know, companies. Um, you know, we believe in our core values, uh, which is about our team spirit, which is working together uh, to and and to make sure that you know sustainability is embedded not only on the plantation level, but mm -hmm. also in our manufacturing sector, yeah. because yeah. we are, as I say, a vertically integrated company, and uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, it is the responsibility for all of us within our own supply chain. So uh, the strategies that we work are probably, you know, we probably have the same, uh, you know, ideology in terms of making sure that sustainability is there, mm -hmm. but maybe the approaches is different, you know. Yeah, yeah. What do we consider priority might be slightly different from SMW or from other uh, oil palm com uh, companies. Um, but definitely we look at climate change, for example, as a priority because, um, 
you know, agriculture is about land. Agriculture is about climate. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is about the people that takes care of the land. So for us, uh, the climate change is very, very uh, serious for us. Uh, that's one reason, for example, that, uh, you know, we adopt the um, UNSG 13 on climate action. Mm -hmm. And we are set to uh, uh, have a benchmark on our climate action in carbon intensity. We aim to reduce our carbon intensity to around 42% by 2025. And, I'm sure, and the government of Malaysia have uh, targeted 45% by 2030. And we hope that we can reduce ours by 42% in 2025. Oh, and oh. hopefully by uh, 2030, we might probably exceed uh, reduction of carbon intensity. So this is one of the, you know, one of the uh, commitment that we are going to uh, publicize uh, in the coming months. Yeah, hopefully. hopefully. So the so last, the last question, 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 uh based on your experience, is the pyramidal structure of the companies affect the execution of the sustainable strategy? This from uh, the, so yes, the, the uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the pyramidal prior structure. Of the, of the companies, companies of the execution of the of sustainable strategy. I think so. I mean, it's very important. Uh, I think um, uh, in a company, uh, governance is very important. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, um, the practice of sustainability, you have environmental, social, and governance. Uh, you can have environmental and you can have social, because those are the things that you need to implement sustainability. But without governance, you know, the implementation of the um, uh, sustainability commitments cannot be done in a manner that is uh, principled. So it's important that uh, governance means transparency, govern and, 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 and it means also, uh, you know, to be uh, honest about what can be done to not overcommit when you cannot do it, because uh, that's going to be one of the worst things that you can do to you and your reputation. So governance ensure that it is also reported to the highest level of management. And I'm not talking just on the, uh, the level of the CEO, but to the board of directors. And this means that uh, the responsibility of everything is not just top down, it is actually the responsibility of all the uh, president. In the yeah, 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 yeah. Because we have to work hand in hand with the government, with the community, and all the other sectors as well. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Serena, for spending your time here with us, Academy of Sciences Malaysia.